So um, here today to present a project that is um, not only about creating pollinator habitat, but quite a bit about people and the relationships um, that we build within natural resources. And so I'm going to highlight uh, quite a bit about how this project got started and then um, what we're doing to create pollinator habitat. Um, so my name is Lauren Pyle Knapp. I am a research ecologist with the Northern Research Station. I'm located in Columbia, Missouri. So I'm on the University of Missouri campus. So to understand how this um, effort was initiated, it's important to understand the roots of the Forest Service. And as some of you might be aware, forestry in North America was established in 1905 with the Forest Service. And it was a new um, practice. And so we really needed research um, to sort of shepherd our hands within managing forests. Um, so Raphael Zahn, who is the first director of research, which was at the time called the Bureau of Silvics, proposed that managers and researchers um, should work together to develop knowledge that was needed and that they would have designed um, designated places for doing this work. And so these were like, places such as the experimental forests um, that we have today. So like the Kaskaskia on the Shawnee National Forest. So the idea that managers and um, scientists would work together has long been an important way of doing work within the Forest Service. And it started from the very beginning. And so within the Forest Service, we have um, three different branches. We have the management side, which is our national forest system, which is like the Shawnee, the Hoosier, and the Mark Twain um, in our area. We have the research branch, which is where I'm located. And then we have state and private, which are folks that um, mostly focus on um, working with our state lands. And then also a big part of that um, program of work is with our fire um, folks. And so there's been some work on the co-production knowledge or the co-production science and where managers and researchers need to come together to sort of bridge the gap to sort of address problems more quickly. And so, um, as I mentioned, for the Forest Service, this has kind of been a long way of doing business. And um, as a Forest Service scientist, our mission is to be public servants first. And so our our work often extends beyond just national forest lands, but also goes to state and private lands as well. So to, to really do uh, the co-production of science um, well, it has to start way in the beginning uh, of a project, and it often takes time to develop these relationships. And so the sort of initiative for this particular project actually started um, happening decades ago with um, the relationship of my project leader to the Hoosier National Forest, um, where they, um, my project leader, Dan Day, met Chris Thornton, who was the civiculturist on that forest at the time at a conference, and they started talking about oak regeneration problems. And from that um, conversation, they developed a research project um, where the Hoosier National Forest was doing a lot of the implementation and Dan and others were leading a lot of the research work. And so from this sort of building of relationships, it helps facilitate when things uh, pop up for managers, they have a direct line of contact with researchers to sort of um, suss out questions that they have, ideas for research projects. And so these relationships are really important, but they have to be encouraged to flourish and that supervisor support is really imperative. So for example, um, I came on to the Northern Research Station um, almost four years ago at this point in time, at, at this point, and Dan, who's this crazy haired guy in the uh, upper middle of the um, screen here, uh, shepherded me along by taking me out to all the national forests sort of within a six hour radius of so the Hoosier, the Shawnee, the Mark Twain, the Medeowin, tall grass prairie um, outside Chicago to sort of talk with managers and see what they're working on and questions that they have to sort of help um, facilitate those relationships. And from that, uh, we have a project using goat browsing and fire on the Mark Twain and then um, the development of this project as well. So again, it's really important about building relationships, but then also um, bringing new people in those relationships. 
Another um, recent experience uh, of co-production of knowledge is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Lake States Pollinator Project. And this is a consortium of national forests in the Great Lakes region that are concerned about reports of native bee declines. And together with Dave King, who's a Northern Research Station uh, employee, applied for funding within the Great Lakes Re um, Restoration Initiative to support and determine what species are present on um, the national forest lands and how their management activities were affecting bee populations. They approached um, the Northern Research Station scientists to provide the guidance on the standardized protocols for the bee sampling, trainings for the personnel for field sampling, um, and then access to trained taxonomists to identify the specimens and analytical uh, capability. So this particular collaboration will yield site-specific best management results for native bee populations um, tailored to the specific uh, national forest lands. And so again, it's those researchers and managers coming together to address problems and um, sort of working within where everyone has um, capabilities and resources to, to make really informed um, decisions. So this, um, this pollinator project that we're gonna talk about actually started on the Hoosier National Forest. So in the early um, 2010s, the Hoosier started um, harvesting timber again. They had been um, sort of stopped from that for a couple of decades and as they started ramping, ramping up their timber program, primarily to do work for, um, to create uh, oak uh, regeneration and also reduce the um, short leaf pine, they were seeing problems within their log landings. And so we're here on one of the log landings and they were noticing that they were failing to re, um, revegetate very quickly. And so they tried a whole bunch of different effort, um, types of treatments to try to see what they could do to try to facilitate uh, revegetation. What's really interesting about this project is it, it wasn't the wildlife biologists or the botanists that were coming um, to the forest leadership to talk about the revegetation problem. It was actually the timber um, folks and also the contracting folks on the national forest that were really interested in doing something different on these landings than just closing them out and walking away. And so the management need here is that, um, you know, poor regeneration of vegetation, the soils are highly compacted. Um, basically you have a lot of log trucks um, really impacting the soil. And so that reduces the ability for vegetation to get established. The idea coming from the Hoosier National Forest was like, well, if we have these areas, why not make them something beneficial? And so there's a lot of conversations about pollinator habitat and particularly bees. And so they wanted to try different methods. And so they started reaching out within the forest to the forest botanist, um, also the soil scientist to see what they could, what they could try. And so they were trying all different types of things. And for some landings, they were having success. And for others, they weren't. And um, they, they needed help. And a lot of this comes from that because they're, re they're ramping up their timber program and harvesting is really controversial, these log landings are an eyesore. And so by doing something positive and providing pollinator habitat, they saw it sort of as a win-win opportunity. And so they saw um, these sort of ugly eyesores as uh, potential habitats. So they reached out to the regional office and university contacts. They weren't able to get a lot of help. Um, and they looked into grants and local funding. Again, it's hard to find um, way to do this type of work. And then they reached out to us um, at the Northern Research Station based on that long-term relationship that we've had. And we were able to sort of come together and create a project that was very interdisciplinary um, across multiple forests. And then um, because budgets are limited, we wanted to see what we could do in terms of grassroots efforts to find ways to fund this work. And so they chose potential. And so then I got involved and brought everybody together. And then we um, worked with the Shawnee and the Mark Twain to see if they were interested 
And the hope is that uh, the pollinators will also be happy as well. And so um, this is actually, we wanted to have the project not only look at, originally we we're like, oh, if we get plants established, we've made pollinator habitat. Um, but it was more complex than that. So we needed to address questions both on the, um, from the pollinator aspect, but also the soils and the plants. So to do that, we brought together uh, a wide range of uh, scientists, um, including those like Debbie Demrose, who works a lot with biochar, Dave King and Susanna Lerman that are um, wildlife biologists, John Kabrick that does a lot of um, forest soils work and civiculture, and Todd Hutchinson, who's a um, plant research plant ecologist, and then Dan, my supervisor, and myself, who really does a lot of invasive species, invasive plant work um, and disturbance ecology work. But most importantly is the relationship and the collaboration that we have with our management folks. And again, this includes um, people that range from timber to uh, botanists, um, to civiculturists, to soil scientists, and everyone um, has had a voice in the development of this project um, from picking what treatments they think will work best, um, the sites, and um, things like developing the seed mix. And so why do we want to build habitat for pollinators and log landing? So bees are a significant conservation interest. They're one of the most diverse animals in the U.S. with more than 4,000 different species. In the Midwest, I believe we have 800 different species of uh, native bees. They can range in size from large bumblebees um, to carpenter bees to tiny sweat bees that are the size of a grain of rice. And um, what I've learned is that a lot of sweat bees are actually flies. And there's a lot of bee mimics out there. Um, it's been really interesting. Uh, certainly plants are something I'm more comfortable with, but I've been learning a lot about bees. And so bees will actively gather large amounts of pollen, which adult bees will use as the main food source for um, developing bee larvae. And because they're very hairy, they will inadvertently move pollen from flower to flower, which is how they pollinate. Although honeybees have received the lion's share of um, press with colony collapse, many of our thousands of native bees have experienced severe declines, which is um, a particular uh, issue in the Midwest, primarily due to the loss of habitat, increased pesticide use, disease, among many other threats. And um, in 2017, the rusty patch bumblebee, as many people know, was one of the first bees to become um, listed in the US. And uh, there is another bee that is currently being considered. And their sensitivity to management, though, can be a double edged sword. Um, although I've listed how bees negatively respond to management, there can also be um, positive um, outcomes due to management. And so from a considerable body of research, which includes um, contributions from the Northern Research Station, um, disturbance-dependent habitats that were historically created by fire and windrow are increasingly scarce on the landscape. So a lot of our forests um, that were cleared and now have come back as forests are pretty homogenous. They're homogenous in age and um, species and as most of us know, if you go out into a mature forest, there's not much going on in the understory. Um, so there's not a lot available for, for bees. And so um, native bees as a group are positively associated with um, disturbed habitats. And so this, the disturbed habitats provide abundant nectar and pollen resources, as well as nesting sites. Many of our native bees are um, ground nesters, um, and also they nest in dead wood. Um, so this slide depicts some of the results um, based on the study up in the Great Lakes, looking at the abundance um, and, species and species diversity were higher in clear cuts as compared to adjacent unmanaged forests. So we need these early successional habitats. So despite the increased abundance of resources for bees in regenerating clear cuts, there's still a lack of pollen resources available for bees because in many cases, uh, we don't have the seed bank or the species there to help provide uh, pollinating resources across the entire growing season or that we have particular species 
that aren't there that um, are very specific to certain bee um, species. The dog is uh, scratching at the door, <laughs> so I apologize. So um, to address this, we came up with an integrated experiment. Um, so we wanted to look at, first we needed to treat the soil, so uh, things that would reduce the um, compaction to our soil. We need to establish pollinator habitat, so in areas where we, have, we don't have the available um, seed, we wanted to be able to see if a seed mix would help. And then also we wanted to um, look at something that would amend the soil in different aspects um, to help establish the native plants. And so not necessarily like a um, uh, like nutrient increases, but we wanted to look at if there was ways in which we could manage the habitat um, using other amendments. I'll talk about that. So on our national forest, we typically have two different types of uh, conditions. And so we have the highly invaded, and this is from the Shawnee National Forest. And so as you can see here, Shalithia spadiza and um, silt grass are highly abundant. This is a um, logging road that's going up to a landing, and then we have a landing on the right. The next condition that we have is completely barren. And so this is where compaction is basically led to plants not being able to get established. And um, this is actually on the Mark Twain National Forest. We typically see the highly invaded sites more on the Hoosier and the Shawnee and then these barren sites can occur on any of the forests, but more predominantly on the Mark Twain. And so the goal was to create functional pollinator habitat in three years. The reason why um, we selected three years is usually by three years, we are getting native vegetation to establish. It might not be our desired vegetation, um, but we wanted to do it before then. And so we wanted to have flowers, abundant flowers, 40s within three years. And so we wanted to design an approach that would look at um, what treatments would work best under what kind of environmental conditions. Um, and we measured this by plant diversity, abundance, floral availability, native bee abundance and diversity, reduction in soil compaction, and in an increase in water holding capacity. And we wanted that fast and ephemeral response. Um, it is, ephemeral is important here because um, from a national forest perspective, we did not want to manage these as um, wildlife openings, which have a different context. Um, they are always wildlife openings. For these, um, the landings might be used again. So if we do a thinning, we might come back in 10 years to do another thinning. And so we don't want to say you can't come back and use this log landing as a log landing again because it's providing habitat. We kind of just want to say we're making great habitat, functional habitat within the time frame of three years. What happens thereafter? Um, is up to the different management objectives for that site. So what are we testing? We're testing an amendment, so soil amendment, and that's biochar. We're remediating the soil with subsoiling, and we're testing a native seed mix. And then we have all combinations of those. So it's a factorial experiment, allows us to sort of tease apart what's working on what types of sites, um, and sites meaning what forest, what soil conditions, um, than uh, with what other complicating factors such as invasive species. So just to give you an idea of what our treatments look like, um, our treatments are arranged as a um, randomized complete block. So that means we have all treatments um, within each landing and we have five landings per forest. And we have three national forests that we're doing this work on. So the Mark Bay, the Shawnee and the Hoosier. And, um, Within each treatment, we have a split plot of seeding versus no seeding. And um, we also compare those to five untreated landings to look at um, just a control site. 
Uh, so to select for the landings, the National Forest put together a list of recently closed out log landings. And we visited each, we took video because it was COVID and we needed to share um, what the sites looked like for folks that couldn't travel. Been kind of interesting getting a large project going during COVID. Um, and then we had 10 landings per forest, so five for treatment, five for the passive revegetation. And then we needed to have some independence of those sites. So each landing is approximately a quarter mile apart or greater. Um, and that's important because we need to have sampling independence because um, unlike plants, bees can fly. And so large body bees can travel up to a quarter mile. And so we needed to make sure that they were, um, that the probability that of them being in both landings was low. So just to give you an idea of what this, the layout looks like. This is um, the Shawnee National Forest um, Landing 6 and it's near Carver's Ridge. And um, you can see the different colors here. Blue is our ripping times biochar treatment. Green is biochar, red is ripping, and orange is our control. And those are randomly assigned at each landing. And then we have a seed, no seed split plot. So the one means seed and zero means no seed. And so before we did any of our treatments, we went out and collected um, pre-treatment pre soil data. And this looks at the compaction of the soil. Now, root limiting growth is, I believe, around 1.4 um, grams per cubic centimeter for bulk density. And um, so we took uh, soil samples at different depths. The blue dot is 0 to 10 centimeters. The orange dot is 10 to 20. The gray dot is 20 to 30 centimeters. And so as you can see here, um, the bulk density or the compaction, um, so increased bulk density means increased compaction. Um, we had highest compaction on the Hoosier, all by the Shawnee, and the lowest compaction, although still compacted, um, on the Mark Twain. The yellow indicates the sort of normal forest condition. And so certainly the log landings deviate from what is a normal bulk density. And um, that goes, the compaction is seen in all of those different sampling horizons that we have. And so the hope here is that our treatments will help reduce some of this bulk density um, on the landings, which will hopefully help land establishment. So to reduce compaction, um, we had many conversations about how to do that. On the Hoosier National Forest, they had some um, experience using a ripper. And so it's basically like three times that um, you push through the soil or pull through the soil. And um, it's often done on agricultural soils, but not so much within forested soils. We had difficulty finding um, one that we could just rent. And so we actually ended up buying one that we used on all three national forests. Um, Basically what you do is it like one pass will get about a foot deep and it doesn't turn over the soil horizon. So that's very important. Um, but you need a, like a skid steer to be able to pull it through the soil. And so the picture at the bottom actually shows a natural soil profile versus compacted. You can see where everything's layering on top of each other and then a subsoil profile. And this um, subsoiling, was more often used in forest management back when we did a lot more intensive forest management practices, um, but has certainly been um, something that's not used as readily for, for many reasons. But for these compacted areas, um, could be highly beneficial to sort of uh, move our soil profiles into a more positive um, direction. So just give you a look, this is um, the inset picture here is, you can see the line where the subsoil went through and John K. Rick is looking down to see how far the soil, um, the subsoiler went down into the soil. And so it's kind of, um, as I've learned, I am not an implementation uh, type person. I didn't grow up on a farm or anything like that. So this was all very new to me, um, but ripping is an art form in, a, in some respect um, because the soil needs to be not too wet and not too dry 
um, either end of the spectrum can result in sort of big massive pieces that kind of uh, default um, end up not making anything any better. And so um, we kind of had to find that good sweet spot. They found that doing this in the fall and winter was the um, easiest in terms of implementation. And um, we had pretty successful results. And we're going to um, be seeing how those treatments impacted our compaction um, actually this year. So uh, biochar, um, why and what does it do? So biochar is a carbon. It's common in fire adapted ecosystems. And so when we used to have fire across the landscape more often, um, wood or plants, um, grasses would turn to charcoal. And that charcoal would go back into our soils because we're not doing that. We don't have that increase in charcoal load. Biochar um, is also is used in agriculture um, from a forestry operations perspective. It can actually be um, an additional forest product, and so it's really good for small diameter stuff that does not have a current market. Um, it will increase the recalcitrant um, soil carbon into the soil, which will help improve. Um, infiltration, porosity, water holding capacity, which helps reduce soil compaction. It's not well tested in eastern U.S. forests. Um, there's been quite a bit of work with Debbie Demrose, who's part of this project, um, in the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and also um, in California, in Washington. So um, it helps soils by um, greater drought resilience the less runoff, less erosion, which would be really beneficial in places like our log landing, decreases soil density and improves porosity. It can help be a mitigant of climate change um, because it is a, recalc a recalcitrant carbon. Um, applying it to soils will help um, increase soil carbon um, loads, increased plant growth and survival. And so people are also testing this it's been tested more in agricultural systems, and so it's been now um, people are interested in more natural systems, um, not only for species, native species that aren't really wanting that sort of nutrient flush. It can help um, sort of tie up nitrogen because it's increasing carbon. Um, and so species that are adapted to that, more of our like native prairie species, um, might have more positive outcomes. Interestingly enough, and this is something that we want to look at, is does adding biochar negatively impact our invasive species, such as silgrass and Cerecia lespedeza, um, to a point where our native species can respond positively? And then this biochar application of log landings can help us um, sort of see what they would be like in other land management applications for uh, eastern forests. So again, it's been used in agriculture. It's produced from slash or um, from blowdown trees. So basically where there's not a market for a lot of other um, forest products, biochar has the ability um, um, to be a new product. And so um, it's being used a lot in land management applications, animal bedding, um, seeing it pop up in beauty products. I've seen quite a few things of charcoal and toothpaste. Um, construction and nano materials. So it's just another product, wood product, a sustainable wood product. So just to give you a few pictures of what the implementation looks like on our log landings. So the biochar that we purchased was um, out of Columbia, Missouri. There was a manufacturer there, or I guess the, um, at least the company is located in Columbia, Missouri, but they get most of their products from pine markets in the southeast. And our product was actually very um, much like sand, whereas a lot of the other biochar we've seen is more chunky. Um, and so that, that the picture in the left is of what, what we purchased. Um, and then applying it was kind of interesting because it was very fine sand. We actually ended up getting this spreader. Um, we rented it from, I think, uh, golf um, course place. Um, so kind of like a fertilizer spreader. And um, that was really helpful getting it across our log landings. But depending on the biochar, 
The idea here would be that the National Forest or whoever could actually make the biochar on site with um, flash or residual harvest re residue. Um, so it's sort of a contained system once, once it's all, um, if biochar ends up being a successful treatment. Um, so yeah, let's go next slide. So the implementation of the ripping time biochar treatment. So we um, applied the, I'm sorry, what I was thinking about was we applied seven tons per acre of biochar. It might have been five. I'm sorry, I'll have to look back at my notes for that one. But um, we applied it to the soil surface and then um, for the biochar alone treatment and then the ripping time biochar treatment, we applied the biochar and then we um, did the subsoil. And that's what should. And so then we also have the seed mix. And so for the seed mix, we again um, works very collaboratively with our soil, with our forest bot, uh, botanists, um, and then other our wildlife folks to sort of think about species that would be native across all three of our uh, all three of our sites. Um, we wanted to have a comparable seed mix across the sites. So that we can see response differences um, depending on if you were out in Missouri versus Indiana, and then how those were responding to different soil types. We wanted um, pollinator um, resources to be available across the growing season. So we tried to diversify across the spring, summer, and fall. Summer, of course, being the easiest to find things that would flower. We also wanted plants that would provide um, resources for the species that we were particularly interested in. That was for the bees. Of course, that benefits many other pollinators. Um, but we also had other considerations when considering this um, seed mix. So we wanted something to be, we wanted species that were highly competitive because we knew particularly on the Shawnee and the Hoosier, we had highly competitive non-native species. We wanted some level of shade tolerance because some of these landings are quite small and surrounded by a forested landscape. And we wanted them to be highly adaptive. And so um, with those sort of prerequisites, we came up with a seed mix that had four grasses. We wanted to make sure we had a grass component in there as well, and then 27 four. And so um, the, the idea here is not that we would use this entire seed mix um, at the end of the study, but that through this study, we would see which species did well where. And so with limited resources and seed being quite expensive, could we focus it on um, a certain number of species? And then for the grasses and also some of these native plants, interested in do these landings provide a focal area of where we can help facilitate some of these species back into our woodlands? So um, our seeding implementation, again, it was a split plot design. We seeded about 10 pounds per acre with an equal um, part of vermiculite. And then we covered it with straw, um, basically to help reduce seed movement between the treatments, um, hopefully reduce some predation by birds. And really it provided a visual indicator of where we seeded and where we did not. So by design, um, this project is to help examine soil remediation methods and biochar um, and methods for establishing pollinator habitat and then how bees respond to that. It's across a large geographical area. And so the idea is that not only can this be used by the national forest where the project is occurring, but other national forests, we certainly have um, folks from both the Southeast and um, the Northern Midwest that are a part of our sort of collaborative group. And we also hope that the findings um, are of interest to our state and private lands when they do harvesting. So what we're monitoring. So specifically, we're looking at changes in um, bulk density, porosity, infiltration, texture, water holding capacity, um, chemical changes, we're looking at plants, abundance, diversity, floral availability, the quality, competitive interactions with our invasive plants. And then pollinators, we're looking at, um, are they using our treated landings 
Um, is there a greater abundance and diversity on our treated landings versus non-treated landings? And we're also looking at if they're using the landings, the treated landings um, for um, sites. So to get this work done, we have two graduate students. One, um, Eliza Fassler, she's at UMass Amherst and she's working with Susanna and Dave um, who are located there. And um, she spent all summer out collecting bees and I'll show a few slides from that. And then Will Rump is looking at the soil side of things. And then we have a team of undergraduate um, technicians that helps a lot with the plant uh, work. So the, um, the project is highly interdisciplinary and we also have the students working together as an interdisciplinary team. Um, so Eliza and Will are working closely together. The, the plant students are working uh, with Eliza and Will and they all go around and do things together. So it's a really interesting um, way to show how natural resources um, should be, should look into the future. And so this is the team. And so um, the first growing season monitoring was summer. So we implemented all the treatments um, in basically from December 2020 through March of 2021. So we are only in our first um, season of monitoring. Um, so Eliza here, uh, Jackson and Ben are at the University of Missouri and Zach who is a recent graduate. They spent all summer going around collecting bees and monitoring plants. So for the bee monitoring, um, they did standard protocols, which is setting out fluorescent cups, yellow, white, and blue um, across the landings um, in transects. They also did sweet netting and they did three rounds of surveys. And so early, mid, and late growing season because different bees will be out at different times. Um, as we know, plants flower at different times. And so um, specific bees will follow the same technology. Um, and so plant monitoring, we did quarter meter sampling frames every two meters along the treatment transect, and then also did that in our control. And we're looking at total richness, um, by species coverage, and then number of plants within flower. Because we, again, went to that ephemeral habitat, and within three years, we want flower plants to be flowering um, as quickly as possible. So from establishment and growth and flowering um, to make sure that we have those resources available for bees. We're also looking at primary productivity. So we're assessing the treatment differences and the production of plant biomass. I'm actually gonna be on the Shawnee tomorrow through Friday, um, collecting, doing these cook plots um, where we're looking at, you know, does subsoiling or biochar create more primary productivity, more plant biomass than the controls or the seeding really help. And so some of our first year observations um, are seeded species, uh, plants coriaceous, showy tick seed, narrowly sunflower, partridge pea, and black-eyed Susan also um, were all um, established and flowering on our landings. Um, it was interesting, some of the species did better on in some sites than others. Showy tick seed has done really well on the Shawnee and the Hoosier, and we're like, whereas Narrowly sunflower is doing better on the mark point. The treatments do appear to matter at this point, although I haven't done the analyses to actually look at that. Um, but we'll see in this image on the lower left, um, on the left side of the picture is the non-seeded area, on the right side is the seeded area, and that's all bitens doing really, really well. And this is also in the foreground a biochar times ripping treatment, where as you move up the slope there, there's other treatments within there. So currently it looks like the biochar and ripping treatment are doing the best, but um, again, we still need to look at um, the data in more detail and also uh, we will be monitoring for the next couple of years. So going forward, um, we're gonna do some soil sampling this winter. So we'll be, we'll be out there looking at changes in the in soil compaction and then the nutrient statuses between the treatments. 
The bee and plant sampling will happen in the growing season of 2022 and 2023. And then the hope, in addition to you know, peer reviewed journal publications, is this development of an integrated management guide, kind of giving a stepwise idea of if you have this type of site, um, this type of soil compaction, uh, you might want to try these, these species of plants and these treatments. So with that, um, I'll acknowledge our national forest folks. Um, everyone here works together. We have meetings regularly where ideas are shared. Um, we've had a lot of people and volunteers that helped us with the on the ground implementation. And because this is a grassroots project, um, funding came from multiple sources and that's how we were able to get the work done on the ground. And with that, I'll take any questions.